Tonight we have Mr. Joseph Crowley, who is the Program Coordinator for our Youth Services Bureau. Welcome, Joe. Hi, everybody. Does anyone wish to make any public comment? I'm hearing none. We can move right to the consent agenda. If there are no corrections or comments or questions, the motion to approve would be in order. Mm -hmm. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Motion passes unanimously. We have some uh, correspondence. Uh, principal amongst those is uh, a letter about the high school accreditation and the report of how the high school is. Do any board members have any questions or comments concerning that? Okay. I think then we can move directly to the superintendent's report. Sure. Very excited tonight. I think we're in for a, a very informative presentation and we're going to hear from a bunch of people from Clark Lane Middle School around two particular topics, their standards-based grading work and their PBIS work uh, throughout the course of this year. You've heard us mention a number of times terms such as Great Schools Partnership, League of Innovative Schools, Standards-Based Grading, uh, all of those things. And this presentation tonight is meant to really kind of tie all those, those uh, thoughts and words together to give you an update on where the middle school is those of you who have had an elementary student perhaps go through our district, uh, our elementary schools have done standards-based standards grading for quite a while, um, and uh, it's, it's more common at that level than the secondary level, but uh, it, it, it adds great value uh, to students' understanding of, of where they're at in their learning, and then we're going to hear about PBIS, which is a school climate and student behavior endeavor at the middle school, and I'm going to let Mr. Sachs introduce everybody that is with him tonight. So, for yours, Jim. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good evening, everyone. I want to introduce all the people that are presenting with us tonight. Casey Morris is the principal. Audrey Montanero is our health and wellness teacher, and she's also one of the people in charge of our uh, new PDIS committee. Uh, curriculum leader also for PE and health. Beth Cherry, an LA teacher as well, also um, one of the lead people on the, the new pride committee, it's called. Uh, Kristen Millay is a science teacher. She's also a member of the school climate committee. Actually, an administrative intern as well this year. Um, Allison Stahl is curriculum leader, LA coach, LA teacher. She's also a representative of ours for our great schools partnership um, when we go to the conferences for League of Innovative Schools. And Mark um, Higgins here is curriculum leader. He is also a representative um, for us at the great schools partners conferences, and he's also um, a social studies history teacher, six and eight. Also dancing with the I did not film the prepare dance. <laughs> so I was thinking about how to introduce both of these um, large pieces of our school growth plan, and I wanted to just reflect on the fact that what we're trying to do are two very large systemic changes that go really to the core of people's beliefs. So while I'm going to give you an example from Clark Lane, I want you to think of your own uh, experiences with grading and your experiences with behavior and discipline. Okay. So if you think about a time frame, both of these um, initiatives or programs are going to take us three years. And if you think about this board, four years ago we presented an electives program. So at that time we presented two or three electives that we piloted, and they went quite well, and we surveyed students, and they gave us input, and we expanded that the following year. And as those electives grew, our study hall shrank, and we had fears about reducing study halls in the middle school. As it turned out, we now offer 25 electives, three or four of them are unified, which is really unprecedented, and we have almost no parent pushback regarding study halls, and the study halls that we have are very targeted intervention study halls. So that process took four years. But we are a much better school for taking our time and doing that right. We could have just snapped our fingers one year and said we're going to institute all these electives, but we took it slow and steady and we're in a really great place with the electives. That holds true for the two programs we're going to present tonight. So um, the first one involves 
or you can work on standard-based report cards. And um, you can certainly read where we were, the concerns we have. Um, one was about a mix of effort and grading that was appearing in report cards. One was about a range of the number of tasks and what tasks we were focusing on and how teachers were weighing those tasks. Another was the variety of tasks and whether or not they were always connected or not to standards. And another one was the need for consistency amongst teachers, amongst departments, and what was showing up in, in their grade books. I think Allison wanted to mention something about that experience. Sure. Uh, so last year was the first year that teachers, we all sat down together as an entire faculty by department, and we actually looked at our grade books. I want to say we opened our grade books, but that's not true because they're now online. So if you think about it, you know, those of us who have been teaching long enough, we used to have paper grade books. And so what we decided to put in there was completely private, really. And at the end of the trimester, the semester, the kids saw their grades, the parents saw their grades, and that was it. Now, of course, we're so much more transparent. Parents can see what's on there, but we've never had the discussion side by side as to what are you grading, how much weight are you giving it. So to sit side by side and look at each other's grade books, it sparks a whole lot of conversation. It was eye-opening uh, because so many of us have a variety of practices. So that was a great way, I think, to get the conversation going, and that was just last year. And some of these little touch points along the way weren't always the most comfortable thing for people as well. So opening up your grade book to your colleagues, you might be teaching alongside them for 10 years, and you never shared each other's grade books, can be a little bit, you know, make you a little uneasy, but it also brings up a lot of questions between people <coughs> and conversations, and that was an excellent experience. So that first year, we did a lot of foundational work, and we really got people to see the inconsistencies that brought us to this year. And this year's work involves us working closely with the Big Schools Partnership, and what we have been doing is looking at a number of things sort of overlapping, but primarily we really started with the research nationally on the importance of thinking about grades as a standard-based report and mastery learning and also separating out habits and the prepared students. So the work we're doing is we, we started doing some really good work on separating out, separating out the standards by discipline. Then we sort of started to merge with the work um, the GSP is doing with the high school. We slowed that down a bit and we're going to work more alongside the high school on that piece. They are working on the <coughs> portrait of a graduate, and we're going to work on the portrait of a rising ninth grader. So we're going to do that in tandem with the guidance of grade schools partnership. What we're going to try to achieve this year is to finalize our retake and review policy, which is really an important piece of this, because that sends the message that we're not satisfied until you complete the standard. So everyone has a retake and re redo attitude and policy, and you're saying to the student, we're not going to be happy until you've mastered the standard. So that's the piece that we're going to work on this year and complete this year. And then we're starting to work on something called habits of mind, or I'm thinking that maybe we'll call it the prepared student rubric. And that piece will separate out the standards that the student is achieving from effort or the things that we commonly associate with a successful prepared student. So that's where we're moving on those two. I think Mark wanted to reflect on his experience. He just got back from the Great Schools Partners Conference. And sure. Uh, so I was up at the conference on Monday and Tuesday. Thank you for the opportunity. <laughs> um, and uh, I learned a lot today. I was talking about all my takeaways. Um, but one of them is that this is going to be a really long and difficult process. Um, the end result is great. It's transformative. It's going to make the school a better place. It's going to make learning better. But to get there, it's going to take us a while. Um, and every school that we saw present, and I must have seen six different schools, I think, who were presenting, and they were different on different topics related to the state report. And all of them talked about how they were five, six years before they even got a little bit of a steady point. So um, while it's not going to be quick um, to do it right and to change the school, it's going to take a while. And so we will eventually come up with, I'm going to go to the next slide, we will come up with models of, of these rubrics for the prepared student. We will come up with a definitive retake and redo policy. And then we'll start putting together draft report cards. We'll base that on both our internal work and models that are out there. We have a lot of guidance um, from court <laughs> from great schools partners. 
and a lot of samples and examples. But I mean, in the end, it has to be consensus, and we want to really move toward uh, clarity of reporting that's consistent among teachers that would benefit a parent looking at a report card, understanding what their child has mastered and what type of uh, work ethic their child has. And it's a little different than what we're doing now because people, in some cases, are mixing those two a little bit and it's not as clear. Okay. Um, and then the, the idea would be a pilot next year and in the fall of 2020 to have the entire school on the standard basis <coughs> report card system. So, I mean, I'm sure along the way I'm going to have to give you some other reports about parental communication. Um, some of the technological challenges are really interesting. How do you get power school, something we own and use, to create something that's master-based? So we've already done some preliminary use of IT, Tracy and I, and we think we can do a lot of different versions, but we want the teachers to really, um, you know, help create this entire system so they feel really comfortable with it. Okay. The next, um, the next big list is, can I say, really goes <coughs> to the fundamentals of, you know, all of our experiences. And this one, I will be honest, there were some times this year in our work, and, and I'll just maybe comment upon this or Kristen or Beth, that we have some really tough conversations because, because the school climate in the area of behavior and discipline goes to everyone's soul and experience, okay? So I'll tell you where we were first. Um, we were at a place of inconsistent approaches, so there were times in the school we weren't happy with behavior, or we weren't happy with the decreasing behavior. So there are inconsistent approaches, there were disconnections between the staff and the administration about how to treat certain behaviors, how to discipline certain behaviors, and how we uh, educate students on behaviors. Um, there have been some behaviors that have continued, and they haven't really gone up or down much, but they continue straight on, and we don't like that. Um, there's certainly different opinions and perceptions about the expectations of the school in 2019. Um, I can give you just one example of a phone. So you've got so many, so many opinions. A phone, a simple phone going from the bus to the home room, is the point of a lot of discussion. And it doesn't seem like a big deal, but it does create its own little set of issues in the school. So all of these little points uh, have to be discussed. And at the same time, there's all this new regulation, uh, most of it very justified, about keeping students in school more. <coughs> it's been shown that when you suspend students, their rate of recidivism and their rate of failure increases. So the more you have kids out of school, the more they just don't do well. They keep the cycle continues. They don't get their education, and they end up dropping out. So we get that, and we want to keep kids in school as much as possible. So there's a little quote on the bottom of the slide. Um, it says it's not about a bigger hammer. It's about a different tool. I'd like to modify that a little. It's about having a lot of tools to deal with a lot of situations, picking the right ones, and being consistent about using them. It's the consistency that's really key here. Um, we're basing some of this on the experience that I was about. She's had they've been using the same um, consultant we are using at Conversa from uh, Reaching Beyond the Classroom, and she's working really closely with us uh, almost on a monthly, weekly and monthly basis in certain circumstances. Uh, Great Neck and Quaker Hill are already PBS, PBIS certified, so that's the direction we're going. We have big changes for next year and then some changes for the following year. So I'm going to hand over to Tracy to talk about... And just as a point, sure. the other two schools were certified this year. So while uh, Oswagachi had done this training starting back five years ago, and it's a three-year process. So out of the concerns and frustrations that Jim outlined on the previous um, screen. We sat down towards the end of last year, the beginning of the summer. Um, the two of us together, we sat with Tom, we sat with Craig um, about like what are our next moves? What are we going to do as a school um, to improve this? Because the, the behavior of kids really impacts the um, attitude of adults who come into the building every single day. And we were feeling more and more you know, disconnect and more and more frustration, especially at the end of the spring season, which was just about to enter a pot. So, we're, <laughs> um, so we're, we're trying to make things that can sustain us um, down the road. So 
Um, out of that conversation, Tom has experience as a middle school principal in a, in a, in a school that was a PBIS school. Abogashi saw great success when they went through the training and they took the time to um, develop the common language around expectations and behavior um, that we really need. So we're fortunate to have been able to bring on Nancy Mercer, who works with Abogashi, so she's very familiar with the district. Um, um, and the work that they did that we can just, you know, kind of build upon. So our work in year one was to really um, set the stage, a lot of behind the scenes work of our committee. So over the summer, we identified um, a, a, a committee of people who represent, you know, the different areas of the school. We try to represent every grade level, department, um, to get lots of um, input on the work that needed to be done. We asked for the three-year commitment on the part of the committee so that they can see the work um, all the way through um, beginning to end. And that commitment has been um, six full days of training. Um, we've completed four out of those six days already. I think we added actually an extra day because we needed um, to get some work done of, of really hard work and hard conversations. and and honest ones about people's beliefs about how things should be handled, what the expectations should be, what the consequences should be when kids um, have an infraction. We haven't settled everything yet. I mean, we're still um, in the beginning of this work. So this group has committed to a lot of work, the, the full days of training, the monthly after school meetings so that we can continue um, getting things ready to roll out. And we just started um, you know, on March 8th, we used a chunk of time to share our work um, with the full staff. Um, so Beth is going to share that work with you. Sure. So first I want to say thank you to Jen and Tracy for giving us such a, a forum and Tom and Craig for giving us this time together to work because we have a passionate team of people who are working really hard as Jim said to have those conversations and those of the committee really appreciate that those conversations are happening and we feel very strongly about where we're headed. So far we've worked together to define kind of an overarching PBIS mission for Clark Lane, which is pride in our behavior, pride in our learning, pride in our community. So that when we see behaviors that we know aren't what we're looking for from students, we can say, are you proud of that choice? Is that the choice you want to make? Does that reflect pride in your learning? Or whatever the case may be in that moment. So it's a touch point for us to all have that in common. From there, we created behavioral expectation matrices for every area of the school, the cafeteria, the bathroom, the hallway, um, <laughs> any nook and cranny you could think of. Um, and then after sharing that with teachers, we had feedback on what about this area or this area that we didn't think of. So we've created these lists of positive expectations, what we want students to do, what behavior should look like when we're in an assembly, when we have an evacuation, when they're walking down the hallway. Um, and then during our March PD, we also introduced that to staff, and staff was asked to create one for their own individual classrooms so that we have that common language across the school. So that's been a huge piece of our work. We've also revised our referral process so that we can be more consistent. Um, we are getting a new uh, database. Do you want to talk about that? Or do you want to? Sure. Um, so the district is going to all, at least um, pre-K to 6, we're gonna, or 8, we're going to use the SWIFT database system, which is going to allow us to track behaviors in a much more like user-friendly and manageable way than we currently have. So the referral form needs to be aligned to that system, the kind of information that it will ask for. Um, the, the type of infraction which we really had to define. So what does disrespect look like? What is disrespect that's what we call, we call minor teacher-managed behavior? And what would disrespect look like that's major that would come kind of immediately to um, an administrator. We have to talk those things out because those are the things that are different. Every teacher has a different, every individual has a different opinion on what is disrespectful. Um, Can I just interject a little example of that? We had a really interesting discussion about if a student had a locker, he drops a book at his foot and swears loudly. What is that in a middle school in terms of an effect? So you can think of that as a major because they swore loudly in front of other kids. You can think of that as a minor, because the teacher could turn around and say, oh, my bad, sorry. So there's that one little thing, example, 
generates a lot of discussion, and so you really need to almost talk through a lot of scenarios to bring people together to really talk about an agreed upon set of expectations. There's certainly non-negotiable expectations such as racist <coughs> and hands off and things like that, but then there's a lot of really gray area minor pieces of behavior that this is why it takes a little while to work through. So the database, as once we define the behaviors and we know what we want to record <coughs> and keep track of, will allow us then to sort and look at data in all kinds of different ways. We can look at hallways, just hallways, or just the eighth grade hallway, or just the sixth grade hallway. We can look at bathrooms. We can look at bus behavior um, and notice where the trends are and where then we need to, as a committee, not just us, but as a committee, figure out what we need to do um, to address those concerns. Do we need to, you know, assign more staff to those areas at certain times? Um, you know, monitor a little bit. Do we need to reteach groups of students about a certain, a certain behavior? Um, just much more easily than we can currently do with our power school system. Right, so we actually have recreated our referral form, and there'll be now a common form that teachers can use for minor offenses, which are teacher managed, and major offenses, which are administration managed, and all of them will be reported in the office so that if we have a student who is exhibiting certain minor behaviors throughout the building, we are able to know more quickly. You know, there's a level at which, because we have a team model, that we've been able to, within the four classes, have those conversations very easily. And, oh, how is this child doing? How is this child doing? What are you seeing? But when they go out to other classes, we might not see that, or if there's certain behaviors in the hallways. So we can more quickly work with those students to change those behaviors. I think to add to what Beth's saying, uh, I think we're all really excited about this new form because right now, as it stands, if if someone does something wrong in my class, if I give them a consequence, no one else ever knows about it. That's something I deal with. Tracy would never know. And right now, there's no way to track all those minor level offenses. So when it comes to one of the administrators, they don't know the history, and they think it's the first time. So this program will be a really nice way, and that consistency, because that's what a lot of the frustration is coming from there will be a lot more consistency there. So, so I'm, I'm sorry. No. You have nothing now that says or tracks if a student's bad in science for the English teacher to know. So let me clarify. If the student's bad enough that it comes to us, we know. <coughs> no, no. Okay. I mean, not on the administrative level. If the student's bad in science, the English teacher cannot look to see if the student threw chalk in science versus the English. But not chalk. Right. So, you're missing the minor piece. I got the major, so. Well, I get the major, but I'm asking, so the minor. No, no, not class to class. Okay. When is that starting? So, great. We're actually introducing that on Monday at our faculty meeting. We're going to be sharing that. <laughs> yeah. We're on it. Uh, and we have a subcommittee who was trained in the community, um, and we have, you know, really worked hard on that referral form so that we can put that out to staff. One of the other things that we did with our behavioral expectations was to say, okay, what are, you know, the big norms for students at Clark Lane? no matter what area they're in, these are kind of the non-negotiables. And then we have added to those some descriptions and some explanations of exactly what to do and how to go about those. We're going to be giving those to staff on Monday. We're going to be asked in to start using those referral forms so we can start this practice and using the new database to track those things, especially as we heat up into our trimester. It'll be more of a pilot this spring so to see how the referral form works, how the data entry works, and then uh, if we need to tweak things over the over the summer and then so we own the database at the beginning of it. And and right now it's been mostly committee work. It hasn't involved the whole staff. It started involving the whole staff in this half of the year, in 2019. But there was a lot of background work that we had to do as a committee to even understand where it was we were going. Okay. Um, and a lot of that 
small committee work of trying to, you know, negotiate barter, how do you feel about this, what, what do we really believe, right. where do we want the school to go, and we didn't want to send out a message to the rest of the staff that was either piecemeal or that we weren't confident in because it's been, you know, a high tension sure. piece for us. We wanted to go to the staff with something that we felt strongly about, that we felt confident about, and that we feel very good bringing to our school. And, and I think it's really important that you have total staff buy-in because you can't have one person turning their back and shutting their door and the rest of the people in the hallway are doing their job. Well, you we, are we actually had that exact <laughs> Craig and I talked over one <laughs> to one of their committee meetings at their request and we're inviting ourselves. Um, and that we had that exact conversation that some of the responsibility, yes, kids need to behave, but adults need to do their part right. as well for this to work. And I think one of the things that, that we've, and, and as I think it was Audrey that said, or maybe it was Beth or whatever, I've, I've lived this as a middle school principal, this is something I wholeheartedly believe in. Um, it's, it's a scientifically proven process. Thousands of schools around the world have done this. And, and one of my messages to them was, follow the process and be patient with the process. This is not a kind of freelance and do your own thing. Um, and, and, and to their credit, I mean, this committee, of, and it's mostly teacher-led. Jim and Tracy are on the committee, but they are members of the committee. It's really teachers as much as administrators driving the process. The tremendous dedication on the part of our, our staff with this. Well, I, I think it's really important, and I, I do think it's, it's so important to have complete buy-in and complete consistency, because not only is consistency important in grading, but consistency in behavior Absolutely. is tantamount to everything. And we really needed a reset. This is like a reset for everybody. What what are we going to enforce as behaviors? What are we all going to agree to? And that's why having the teachers on it, it's not us saying this is what we want you to agree to. This is all of us saying this is what is important and what make the environment one where kids can learn. Two questions. Does SWIFT integrate with PowerSchool? So, uh, yes. Uh, so we've had our IT department, Mark here, uh, populate the SWIFT database with PowerSchool. And so we can, we can populate it that way. And then can we get it into PowerSchool? Um, not as easy, but we, what we can do is with our data dashboard and our, on our system that we will have operational next year, we, we can seamlessly integrate it into a teacher and, and principal dashboard. And my second question, does SWIFT, when the teacher has this incident in the classroom and the teacher makes this entry, is there an application or a piece that then in turn notifies the parent? Um, so if the kid's bad in English and the okay. teacher puts it in the swim and says Joey swore because the book dropped, <laughs> does it, is, it, is there an automatic generated piece that will notify the parent so the parent knows Joey swore in English class with the chalk? Right. So I'm going to maybe now he's uh, without putting you on the spot, I just kind of since Asuagashi has uh, utilized this now for its really um, <coughs> third year in a row, if you uh, know if that feature exists within SWIFT? So I'm not uh, perfectly clear if it exists, but we've incorporated in the referral on the bottom um, a line for what was the communication. Ah. So that there's no automatic communication. Mm -hmm. Tell me perfectly yeah. honest. I, I, I'd rather have a teacher reaching out, making yeah. that call. We want the personal touch. Yeah. We want to explain context. SWIFT itself is... Um, I won't say general, but you can't get into too deep of a narrative within that. So having that personal touch um, really helps explain the context, what happened before, what's going to be going forward. I, as an administrator and as a parent, I would prefer getting a phone call or an email for a, a minor um, and having that explanation in the face-to-face. So face. Is the communication piece on your referral? Yeah. yeah. So we have, there's a section on the referral and it's sectioned mm -hmm. out so there's a place for teacher managed, you know, follow up, right. what was the, you know, what did the teacher do, right. or what, you know, the science of students, what did the administrator do, and there and there are common ones that, you know, could be either one, and so whoever is filling it out would do that. So if I were, say, finding a detention as a consequence based off of something that a student did in my class, I would go through and fill out the form, and I would either 
you know, make a phone call or send an email home, depending on, you know, the relationship I have with that parent. I would send that form to the office where one of our secretaries is going to be inputting all of them. So that if we have that repeating minor, right? Student does something in my room, the student does the same basic kind of thing in Audrey's room, later on the student does the same basic thing in Mark's room. That third time, the system actually flags it and it becomes an administrative managed consequence. So we kind of, it's a way for us to say, okay, this is a situation that this student is going to need conversations or a little something more in text here. Right. And that might be something else going on. Well, right. right. So we need to investigate why are we having these mm -hmm. repeat offenses exactly. when you're having consequences across the board. Right. And parent contact is really important. Absolutely. That's what's going on and for them to maybe give you some input as to what's going on. You're absolutely right. And actually, we, along with those student norms that we have, we delineated some teacher norms. So that beyond those, here are some other things that we as Clark County teachers are going to be doing habitually. And one of the things that we put on there very clearly was when you give, you know, consequence like a detention, you need to make sure that you make parent contact. If the child doesn't show up for the first time, then you need to make sure that you make parent contact again and then rearrange it the second time before it becomes, you know, an office referral or something like that. You want to make sure that you kind of have that. So we have that spelled out that they need to make parent contact. This is going to require some more work um, by your staff. I hope everybody's up to it. I think the committee is totally up to it. I hope your whole staff is up to it, too. I think conversations that, that have gone on, everyone is ready for change. Um, and it sounds, especially after the March PD day that we had, we got really, really positive feedback from everyone. We're just excited to try to learn more. And the good news is this is about this is about tier one. It's about setting the expectations. We're hoping to actually reduce referrals and and reduce incidents where we have to discipline kids because we're just setting clear expectations across the board and we're going you know, we'll hold kids accountable. But even the simple reminders about how we behave on a monthly basis, a, a trimester basis, you know, all should help. If we're all enforcing the same rules and expectations, there should be less right. breaking of the rules. Yeah, we were very excited to like move forward, and we wanted to tackle those repeat offenders. And the yeah, I mean, had to say to us, "You need to slow down." We're not even talking about that this year. And at first, the committee kind of yeah. we, we took offense to that. Yeah. We, didn't, <laughs> we can't take this to the faculty that we don't have a plan for that. Which is, this is the process. And some came and said, "This is the process. You need to trust it." And we all took a deep breath and said, "Okay, what can we do with it?" Look, well, <laughs> um, yeah. so that's you know coming, but. We have to, and we realize as we are figuring out the difference between the minor and the major, and oh, well, when we shift our expectations so it's really this and that everybody understands that, okay, we can see how that is going to change things. We can't even have that conversation yet. I, I do have one other one comment. It's kind of uh, on your last bullet on where we are now. Uh, <laughs> You're changing from cougars to women. I have a very interesting question. I really am. So I have run this What is the financial cost of this? Oh, I'm going to answer that too. Oh, yeah. So let me just back a little bit. We'll get to your question. So part of what we're doing next year is we're launching lessons for the first few days of school to teach kids very specifically the behaviors we expect in certain parts of the school. That's number one. Number two, we're going to develop some kind of acknowledgement or an incentive program to really, um, you know, to really recognize and raise awareness and give kids some motivation. Uh, we're going to rebrand Clark Lane to be Clark Lane Lancers, and Kristen is working on a grant right now to cover <laughs> the cost of that. Uh, but we're really excited. I ran this by Andre. I ran this by the athletic director. Mm -hmm. We're excited to be the Clark Lane Lancers. Mm -hmm. The Cougars doesn't have any specific real grounding in the, the town. What do you mean? It's been there forever. Well, <laughs> well <laughs> 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 it's time for change. Let's <laughs> 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 change water for two lives. Get that but, too. <laughs> but we actually looked back and couldn't really even determine why the Clark was a cougar, so. Well, why is why is it the Lancers? <laughs> okay. But I think we want to be the Lancers. Sure. So, yeah. is it fair to say that the faculty have asked for this? Yeah, we surveyed the faculty and 
close to 70% What's the mindset? Uh, they weren't really thrilled with the term Cougar, to be honest with you. It, what did it, 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 what did it, it has a negative connotation. What kind of connotation is that? Uh, no, 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 I know I most naive in nineteen sixty five, but not that naive. Come on. And I can't believe it because that's why. Well, so not only were the adults not super comfortable, but a lot of our eighth grade girls were not comfortable. Really? So we would rather reset with something fresh, ineffective.
you know, what we see. Like, but that's not been a school-wide or department-wide conversation until we started that last year. It's probably a little more line this year out of those conversations that we had at this time last year. Are, are these whatever the grading criteria is for the particular subject area? Are parents communicated that information and, and do kids know that information? Yeah. Yeah. That's on power school they can show the phenomenon of weighting or percentages, uh, this is certainly not unique to Clark Lane Middle School. <coughs> if there's six school districts I've worked in, this is par for the course. Grading is a deeply personal endeavor on the part of the teacher. I mean, a lot of this board are educators or were educators. It's deeply personal. It's, it's what you think. When you look at our elementary, we have some elementary folks, and, and certainly Kristen taught at the elementary level prior to Clark Lane, with a standards-based approach, is the kid be able to complete the concept? There's, there's a lesser degree of subjectivity and more of, of a emphasis and objectivity on what it, does the child, do they know it, and are they able to show it? And it's, it's much more about mastery of the skill or the content versus all those external factors around are they a good kid? Do they raise their hand a lot? Do they bring in their homework? All, all of those things are still important. Those things will be valued at Clark Lane, but it's going to be put in a bucket over here like it is at our elementary school. Uh, just to Please. echo what you just said, I think you said it very nicely, but it's very important that when we get our, you know, the SESPAC scores and all the other, even the other scores that we get, and, and it's showing such a high percent not meeting the standard, yet our honor roll is, you know, 90 million percent full of honor roll, but we're not meeting the standard. Something is not yeah. valued yeah. yet. And, and it's, it's, not, it's not the case. <laughs> well, no, it's not all the time. But that, that exact exercise, when I was a principal, I did that exact exercise. I said, guys we have, and ladies, we have 90 percent of the kids on honor roll, and we're at 70 percent mastery. So there's obviously a, a something within our assessment and grading that 20 more, we think 20 more percent kids are, are at goal, but somebody else is saying differently. So but I'd, like to, but I'd like to add that our, our expanded use of math testing and interim assessments has really helped the teachers to be able to see this more clearly. Right. And then when you do the, the, all the foundational standards work and get them on the review of what the standards are and all of those things, then it gets much tighter to the test you're talking about. So definitely on the path. Study work. Yes. Yes. Jim, I'm having a hard time visualizing what this uh, report card looks like. Can Can you <laughs> sure. some samples? So let's say um, in the yeah. trimester of science, the teacher wants is teaching, let's say, electromagnetism, and there's four standards for learning about electromagnetism. That the teacher would design tasks and labs associated with maybe four standards or five standards. The student would have to pass those standards, show mastery of those standards in a bunch of different ways, and then the teacher would mark off that they achieved the standards. So on the science report card for eighth grade under electromagnetism, it would list the standards and it would show if the student mastered those. At the same time, that same teacher would report out on the preparedness of that student prepared for class, has their homework, participates in class. So they'd be separate, but the, the parent would clearly be able to see what the teacher, I mean, what the student mastered. If there's a point where they didn't master it, the, the student would either be required to come for extra help or there would be a, re, a retake policy that encouraged the student to come back multiple times and be retaught or learn or come after school or be intervened in some way. So and Craig can send the board a sample of our elementary standards report card. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Because I'm, I'm, I'm yeah. not an old yeah. well, so exactly. I'm really having a hard time yeah. visualizing okay. what this looks like. <laughs> and then the objective part is all based on rubrics. Everyone has a consistent rubric. Yeah, They're all based. Okay. Yeah. I would yeah. love to see. So what we and that's nine. That's, that's probably not three, three, five, <laughs> seven years <laughs> out. <laughs> yeah. 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 That's not far out. We will have a. Yeah, uh, even if it's not the one yeah, you end up agreeing, I just, I would just like yeah. to just yeah, we will definitely have put my hands on one. Yeah. to show you, absolutely. Thank you. Well, I think yeah. if you can get the teachers, you know, 
rubrics can be tweaked, uh, even lessons can be tweaked, rubrics can be tweaked, all these things can be tweaked as you experience them in the classroom. And, and I, I think if you kind of put out there, let's all experiment with some rubrics and talk about them with PLCs and everything. In fact, I, I just recently was helping my grandson with something and I saw a rubric. Yeah, you have rubric. And I, I thought it was wonderful. Right. Well, that's the first one I saw. Yeah, and, we have <laughs> and, 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 and it, it was very helpful. Yeah, and I explained yeah. to him what it meant. Right. And, and, and I think it was important I mean, as a grandparent trying to help him with something to know what was expected, he didn't know what was expected and, and what was more important. You know, making it pretty wasn't was he was only going to count five points. That was going to be that. I have uh, two questions. I'm not being an answer because I'm not. I'm an American. I have some tech questions. No, you're not. You're our new sort of Whatever. <laughs> um, two things. Um, this database about behavior, um, I would love it for camp, but obviously you guys do it first. Um, does that update throughout the day, or is it something that compiles at the end of the day? So it's like, let's say something's off at during the day, are you going to catch it before the kids? No, that's a great question. But I, I would imagine it updates at night, and then I just like power school, but I'm not positive. Okay. And then the other question is, Capturing behavior is phenomenal, but if the kid has an off day, not that they're being bad and they're not, you know, being inappropriate, but in terms of something, you know, we go, we're, I'm an educator, something's off, like something's off with that kid, is there a way that you can put that in this system? This is a first there is, so, so I think the answer is there's a narrative section, but if you think about that, database, you understand that, basically, yeah. you can't over narrate because then the system can't slice and dice that. Yeah. So you could put in notes, mm -hmm. but you're never going to be able to sort by notes because that's in plain English that people write. Yeah. So you're still going to have to pick, you know, offenses and mm -hmm. discipline. Mm -hmm. but, there's well, but there's a way to know. There's a piece on um, possible motivation oh, okay. in a referral form, which is one of, I, I really like this piece of it, that when we're filling out the form as a teacher, yeah. we have a spot that specifically asks what the possible motivation is for this behavior. Are they looking to either obtain peer attention, obtain adult attention, maybe avoid peer or adult attention? You know, there's kind of options in there that we can, so maybe track if this student is constantly looking for peer attention, are we giving it to him? <laughs> you know what I mean? Do we need to shift our consequences to reflect that, or is this thing crying out to help in some way? Any other comments or questions from the board? Joey. Just one, I, I just want to thank you for doing this because I think it's going to help the faculty, but at most of all, I think it's going to help the students. And what I like about it too is you're tracking, like in each class, maybe something is bothering a student. And if all the teachers don't know about it, you know, you can't address it right away. Right. And, you know, after having four children, you know, grow up, I know this age is really, really difficult. And I'm very impressed with a lot of the teachers you have. You have a lot of caring teachers at Clark County. And we're lucky to have you. And I'm really glad you're going to be late. I want to commend all of you. Great job. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Professional Learning Day. Oh, sure. March 8th, we had our Spring Professional Learning Day, which coincided with regional professional learning day throughout the region. And Craig is going to give a, a brief synopsis on events of the day. So in your packet, you, you have the very robust uh, program of the day. Uh, just to hit the three um, levels, elementary teachers were really immersed with their last <coughs> two units of science. We're going to continue our pilot until um, the teachers have had a chance to pilot those units before we bring it to the board for full adoption. The middle school had uh, three large buckets of work for the day. Um, they've gotten new interactive whiteboards. Uh, with that comes some training so that we can get the most out of them. Uh, you've heard today about the other two buckets of work from Clark Lane, which was with the standard space grading and the school climate, which had the PBAS component. And the high school has really um, kind of dug in to the, uh, to the NIESC uh, first uh, report, um, and uh, 
the high school is working on that collaborative conference report follow-up task. I also want to note that our paraprofessionals also work uh, in professional development day this day. And at our elementary level, um, we had, my opinion, a very robust uh, day for them with uh, um, having our teacher and Chris Discordia uh, share uh, how they can support with math instruction. So our interventionists showed what's the best practice of math so that they know how to work with math workshops <coughs> in the elementary. Um, Chris and, and Whitney uh, showed about <coughs> how to uh, understand Google Drive to support student learning, so we're a Google district. And then they all had to do the annual uh, bloodborne pathogen. Secondary paras, uh, with the gracious support of the Youth Service Bureau, was uh, trained in mental health first aid, uh, which is a national program. And uh, as far as regional, just three ending statistics. We had nine different regional PDs. Six of them, uh, six Waterford faculty planned and facilitated them, and uh, Waterford hosted five of them. So all in all, it was a tremendous day. Thank you for any questions, Mark? Mark. I just have a Quick comment. I have to uh, commend you. I think this is a very, very professional, professional day. Uh, some of the ones we've seen in the past have not quite measured up to what I think the standards should be, but this one really did have a lot to offer, and I think it will make our teachers and their professionals better for it. I was a little concerned that the high school had the lowest percentage of attendance, with only 82%, so I hope you guys can get a little better and not be on the bottom. Thanks. <laughs> Some of that's out of our control, obviously. Thank you, Craig. Huh. Great. Sure, this is Youth Art Month. So we have work from all of our schools throughout uh, the building and also at Watford Library. Uh, in front of you are some note cards of our student artwork. Uh, and uh, that is in uh, honor of Board Member Appreciation Month. So our students and staff, thank you for all that you do. So some note cards for your use. Uh, we had Board of Finance final action on our budget uh, this past Monday. Our uh, budget was passed as presented and as approved by the Board of Ed. It's now on to RTM in May. I want to commend Clark Lane Middle School teacher Jean Morgan, who was a presenter at the Connecticut Dyslexia Conference a week or two ago. Um, I shared with you in a Friday note that our school district was featured on the CAPS Innovation website. Uh, it has a full printout in front of you, but uh, it's called Digital Detectives, Developing Computer Science Engineers of the Future, and it highlights our K-5 computer science program. And uh, Chris Discordia worked on that proposal with our elementary tech coordinator, Laura McHugh. So, Mostly Laura. So, there you go. <laughs> a good leader distributes the credit. <laughs> uh, last night, I had the opportunity to attend the Eastern Board 8 Basketball Officials Banquet uh, with uh, A.D. Landry, Coach Bassett, and Coach Weinberg as our boys' basketball team was honored by the Local Officials Association. Uh, Craig, Jody, and myself attended the Eastern Connecticut Chamber of Commerce annual meeting last night as former board member Ann Ogden was honored with Volunteer of the Year for the region. So congratulations to Ann. Um, just an update on our K-8 recruitment. Obviously, one's uh, in front of you here tonight. Um, Craig, Kathy, Allison Mosier, Andre, and myself did meet with the other three districts, Norwich, Sprague, and Franklin. And all three of those districts have draft agreements in hand. And um, just waiting to hear back from them on how they're going to proceed. Uh, just some great district events within the last week. I mean, there are always... Uh, great music and art things going on, but uh, Great Neck is having their invention convention. Uh, Clark Lane Middle School had their career day last Friday. Uh, I was particularly personally interested because I met uh, a gentleman by the name of Mike Caplett, who is the Region Emergency Management Director for School Safety. So that was personally he presented. So that was a good guess. Uh, and Quaker Hill had Grit Day uh, last Friday, uh, which is. Uh, Chris, do you want to give 30 seconds on Grit Day? Two of our teachers at the Teacher Leadership Academy have been proud of the project to teach growth mindset. Um, so 
uh, at one time, 45 minute session, the entire school and their classrooms were doing um, cooperative projects that were going to challenge them and they weren't going to get it right the first time. They kind of pushed through and worked together. So teaching kind of that grit mentality, K through five, all at the same time was kind of a neat thing for us to go around and see happening in the whole classroom. So that was uh, just with both and Kathleen Donahue, who was the teacher of Asian Academy. So that was a project. You first heard of these terms, obviously, such as perseverance, but also the term productive struggle. It's okay for kids to struggle and not get it the first time, and that's how they how they grow. So uh, it was a it was a great day, really really interesting day. I just wanted to provide the board with some strategic plan updates. Uh, in the district, uh, might have mentioned that last year and earlier this year we completed an assessment inventory, essentially gathering every single assessment we give in this district. That's being finalized into an assessment framework, and that work is really being led by our instructional coaches which will really outline for our district pre-K to 12 what assessments are formative, what are summative, what are screeners, all of those um, to make sure that, um, A, we're all on the same page, but it will be highly valuable in educating new staff as they come in. Um, our high school and district data team are working on our vision of the graduate, certainly something you've heard about, and that's really getting at what are those transferable <coughs> skills we want to emphasize in our pre-K to 12 college and career readiness piece. So more on that to come for sure. That's certainly a big part of me ask. Uh, our district data team recently did a review of a variety of different higher order thinking skills frameworks. Again, I know this is another action step in our plan. Um, we looked at a variety of frameworks, and that those hot skills will align with our vision of a graduate and ultimately continue to be embedded in curriculum, and uh, we are going to stay with Blooms. That's uh, something that the district is, is very familiar <coughs> with, and we'll continue around that. Marsha, you mentioned rubrics. Uh, we conducted, or are conducting, a rubric inventory and uh, kind of gathering what, what do we have out there. Uh, and next year's work will be to really evaluate all of those rubrics, uh, gain some consistency, and create rubrics uh, <coughs> where there are current uh, gaps. So that, that work continues. Again, all related to strategic plan. Policy committee will be beginning a deep dive. Uh, really, uh, the last deep dive on our policy manual was 03 really going through what policies should be deleted, kept, and add, enhanced, all of those things. Um, we have two to more district data teams meetings uh, this spring uh, that will be used to evaluate this year's project and process on our strategic plan and begin to draft action steps for next year. Next year will be the third year of our strategic plan. Those action steps will have been drafted four years ago, so they still make sense what has changed in the landscape. So again, district data team, uh, looking to uh, you know continue their valuable work and we'll be looking at that membership. The current members have been on there for two years and we'll be looking at staggering so we still maintain some institutional memory on district data team but we get some new folks in the mix as well. I think that's enough. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions or comments to Tom? Okay. To move on now to the committee and other reports. Uh, Marsha, policy. Uh, yes, we had probably our longest meeting yet to date. Uh, we met on December 3rd uh, in 2018 and we reviewed two policies on the agenda for today, for today the administration of meds and the report uh, for suspended, suspected abuse and neglect and the regulation regarding the retention of electronic uh, records. We also met on, in February 25th and that was the long meeting and had uh, a, a lengthy discussion regarding student membership on the Board of Ed. We reviewed the data from the high school listing current opportunities for student awareness of the Board of Ed issues and, and meetings and what other school districts do regu uh, regarding student membership. The committee unanimously de declined to move uh, a formal to a to formal policy to the Board of Ed but instead recommended the high school administrator could appoint student liaisons to our board that, like our other town liaisons to our board, the RTM, the Rec and Parks, and the Finance Board, if an interest arose. We also reviewed a draft of the updated graduation requirement policy, which outlines the statutory and district changes for the class of 2023. <coughs> the committee agreed to remove the learning through service requirement, uh, which was reduced to 40 hours from 80, since the statutory requirement of a capstone 
project will consume a great deal of the student time outside the classroom and would have a community comp component to that project as well as mentorship. Thank you, Marcia. Any questions from the board or comments? Joey? How many of the student liaisons, I mean, would they have a voice on board or do they have questions? Uh, the student liaisons from the high schools, if they, if they do appoint them, would they just be in the audience? They wouldn't have any say on anything? I, I think that they, we would be receptive if they wanted to address us. I would be most interested in hearing what they had to say. It wouldn't just be during public comment. It could be throughout the meeting, something we're discussing. It would be a, <laughs> an agenda item okay. know, where they could speak. It would not be investing them with any greater powers of addressing the board than the regular citizen. Okay. Well, I'm kind of disappointed that we... If the hours are being cut 40 to 40 hours and not required, they're in the, you know, we won't have the discussion now, but we, we will in the future. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Any other uh, committee reports? I just have one more question on the hours. Um, are we still having learning through service or not? They're going to just be 40 hours that are required rather than the cap the, Well, the graduation requirements are still being worked out, but there are new graduation requirements. And within the capstone uh, program, there will be some element of community service. And it is the thinking of the policy committee that because of that, we would no longer require community service as a graduation requirement. But you're reducing the hours from 80 to 40. That, that was by the high school recommendation. That was brought to us from the high school, that it was reduced from 40 to 80 and, and the capstone was added. Okay. Then, that, we, yeah. then we said, well, the capstone, the capstones that I'm familiar with require an awful lot of work. So we made the learning through service hours voluntary rather than... Oh, okay, so it'll still be shown on their records because a lot of colleges... Yes, no, 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 no. They're, they're welcome to do it. Oh, okay. But it's a little bit trapped. Or, I mean, it would be on there. We've still got to work all that out. Okay. This, this is... So it's going, I guess, back to my question. So it's going from 80 to 40. No. Mm -hmm. if, if the... Uh, we, the, the administration was proposing new graduation requirements of 40 hours of community service. The committee felt in light of the capstone that community service should not be a graduation requirement period. But the, the program would still be in place and the students could do it and it would be reflected on their transcript and hopefully benefit, they would benefit still through that service. The community would benefit and it may help them in terms of admissions. So it's going from 80 to optional. Yes. 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 Ah. Yes. So now I have another question. <laughs> so if it's going from 80 to optional and they're not required to do it, before they were required to do it, so before you had a position with someone that was managing 800 kids at 80 hours, so now you have someone in that same position who's not having to manage any of these hours because it's optional. Is that correct? If it goes through, we're still in the draft form. Oh, we, oh. we didn't go into that because okay. that was outside our purview. Yeah. Okay. So it'll come back to us. It may. It may it, it, it's a staffing question. And it's not something that was before policy. Right. But the, but the option of going from 80 to zero will come back to us. Yes. Oh, the the yeah. whole board would have to approve oh, yeah. it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. And I, I think it gives more weight to learning through service hours because when they put it on their, their application, mm -hmm. that's something that they wanted to do, yeah. not mm -hmm. something that they have to do. Yeah, right. Right. So I, I think it's really going to give them a better bang for their hours. The colleges <laughs> look at it. Okay. And oh, the the yeah. projects are enormous. Yes. Yeah. And, no, and our mentor um, by person on staff. Teacher, yeah. yeah. Thank you, Carolina. Yeah. We're going to do that. Both of those requirements. Any other comments or questions on the policy uh, report? Other committee reports? 
story. You said it. Um, Dancing with the Stars was a huge success um, Friday night. And I think it was great that um, Lucas School in London participated and some other teachers from New London and East Line and Waterford. It was a great family night. Um, Joan was a great MC. Did you meet Joe yet? I know I was like, <laughs> okay. I'm sorry, I was I was at a youth service room. Um, they're getting ready for Camp Dash. Um, I wanted to read you some of the topics of the week, um, it's eight weeks. The first one is Lancer Nation Week, <laughs> and that's about sports and art. Let's Splish Splash Water Week, Food Wars, STEM Week, Adventures and Fairy Tales Week, Making Waves Water Week, World Service World Series Week, and Lab Science Week. And you're going to be opening up registration pretty soon, Joe? Okay. Okay. All online as well. Great. Yeah, Joe's a, <laughs> he's, he's an IT genius. Um, we're really happy to have you there. You can do a lot of things online. It helps the parents a lot, too, if they can do it online. I think that's it. Thank you. Any other committee reports? Uh, Chris. 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 No, go ahead. We, just, we had a pretty quick deadline for our band meeting last week. Uh, the superintendent, uh, in regards to Lauren, the superintendent <coughs> of Lauren, Dr. Uh, Holly, is leaving. She's retiring. So Lauren is going to be looking for a new superintendent, and their Ocean Avenue facility is up and running. And a lot of discussion on the possible bills and uh, with the state. So they're doing the same thing as we're doing. They feel the same way. So everyone's kind of on. And that's about it. Thank you, Chris. Any other reports? Okay, new business. We have our annual food certification, the EO uh, 099, the <coughs> 099. We do this every year. We require a, a rather technical motion. Gertie, do you feel any need for discussion? So then you care to make the uh, motion? I'd like to move that the Waterford Board of Education certifies that all food items offered for sale to students in the school under its jurisdiction and not exempted from the Connecticut Nutrition Standards published by the Connecticut State Department of Education will comply with Connecticut <coughs> Nutrition Standards during the period of July 1st, 2019 through July, June 30th, 2020. This certification shall include all food offered for sale to students separately from reimbursable meals at all times and from all sources, including but not limited to school stores, vending machines, school cafeterias, and any fundraising activities on school premises sponsored by the school or by non-school organizations and groups. The Waterford Board of Education directs Ms. Kathy Nain, Director of Food Services at Waterford Public Schools, to submit the ED-099 Addendum Healthy Food Certification as part of the CSBE's online application and claiming uh, system for child nutrition programs for the 2019-20 school year. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. We now have a similar uh, situation with respect to exemptions for foods and beverages in the public schools. But again, we do this every year. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so, I make a motion that the Waterford Board of Education will allow the sale to students of food items that do not meet the Connecticut Nutrition Standards, providing that the following conditions are met. One, the sale of the Connecticut <laughs> event occurring after the end of the regular school day or on the weekend. Two, the sale is at the location of the event. And number three, the food items are not sold from a vending machine or school store. The Waterford Board of Education will also allow the sale to students of beverages not listed in Section 10-221Q of the Connecticut General Statute, provided that the following conditions are met. One, the sale is in connection with an event occurring after the end of the regular school day or on the weekend. Two, the sale is at the location of the event. And three, the beverages are not sold from a vending machine or school store. 
Okay. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? The motion passes. <coughs> Next item, uh, we do this every year with our long term substitutes. It's not a reflection on your performance, uh, it's really to protect us. Um, but we need a motion to accomplish this. I would like to move that the Water Board of Education moves with the contract of, <coughs> of Kyle, Candia, Bobby, Cassandra, Mal, Christine Dubin, and Richard Chiapetta are not renewed for the following year of <coughs> expiration at the end of the 2018-19 school year and that the superintendent of schools is directed to advise such persons in writing of this action. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Next item is our tuition agreement with the town of Pfizer so that some of their students may attend uh, Waterford High School. Tom, do you want to speak to this? Or sure. Like I talked about it before. Yeah. Time? A couple of highlights. Obviously, this agreement was drafted by council, so, um, you know, protects certainly our best interests. Um, this would uh, guarantee Bosra three seats per year, starting with a freshman class as early as next fall, uh, which means they could have no more than 12 students in our high school at any one time. Uh, it would be by lottery, obviously. Um, all special ed and 504 costs would be the responsibility of the sending district, and in this case, Bosra. Uh, there would no, be no transportation responsibilities on our end. Um, in terms of uh, payments, um, regular tuition would be in the arrears. So, for example, we would take an October 1 enrollment count and we would bill them on July 1st of uh, the, the following year. Um, that is similar to the arrangements that these schools have with other partners and it's how they, they budget. Special ed would be billed in the current year as, as it's happening. And certainly there's a termination clause that either party could get out with 12 months notice, but any kids in the pipeline, in, in the school, would be allowed to, to graduate if, if termination was before the end of the agreement. <coughs> Those are kind of the highlights. Um, again, this is uh, very much uh, very similar, very boilerplate with other agreements these, these districts have um, with uh, other partners. Happy to answer any questions, but. Any questions from the board? Jody. The money goes into the general fund. That's uh, yeah. The yeah, that's absolutely right. And that's by state statute. Figures. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? If the child withdraws part way, do we reimburse part of that, or do they lose the whole chunk? If the child is on the roster on October 1, they're responsible. For the entire? Correct. <coughs> okay. All in favor, please say aye. Uh -huh. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes again. Good work, John. Yeah. Team effort. Uh, Policies. We have uh, two policies before us tonight, uh, and they can be approved on a first reading as the changes are required by the law. Great. Sure. The first one is uh, our administration medicine policy, uh, 541.21, uh, and um, this has been uh, corrected to clarify with public acts uh, that students with life written allergic conditions may possess and self administer uh, such possessed administration under certain conditions. Um, the next policy is uh, a DCF policy for uh, suspected uh, abuse and neglect uh, of uh, students by school employees. Um, this one uh, adds uh, licensed behavioral analysis to the mix of mandatory reporters. And you'll also note on uh, letter I that uh, under the um, retaliation uh, <coughs> against uh, reporting that that's been stricken. So good faith does, uh, does not make, um, if you don't make a report under good faith, then that's a problem. And that's really why we've seen uh, statewide some litigation go on. So um, we have uh, trained all of our staff under uh, DCF provisions um, extensively and um, this policy is catching up with state law. So those are the two that we would require or recommend uh, approval tonight. 
Any questions from the board? <laughs> Could I then have a motion for the approval of both policies? So moved. For a second? Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Finally, we have a regulation of 2300. Uh, and, uh, so with the regulation uh, under the definition of uh, what the transitory routine correspondence and digital imaging has been defined and that really will help us as to our retention of records uh, for uh, when we can handle or delete transitory correspondence or routine correspondence. And so this is administrative regulation. It's uh, informed the board that we've made that change uh, with um, best legal practice in mind, and uh, this is what we'll, the rules will be following. Thank you, Craig. Any questions for Craig on this regulation? Okay. A motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? We are adjourned.